This brings us now to the second motivating problem of calculus, known as the velocity problem. So what is the velocity problem? Well, let's start with the idea of an average velocity. This should be an E here. What's an average velocity? Well, just imagine I'm, I'm moving, and I'm, I move a distance of 30 meters in, let's say, 10 seconds. So I've traveled 30 meters in 10 seconds. How fast was I going? Well, you may say, well, you travel 30 meters, 10 seconds, so you're traveling at 3 meters per second. OK, so was I traveling at 3 meters per second the whole time? Or could my speed have changed during that travel? Well, you don't really know. All you know is how far I traveled and the time I was traveling in. So we know that on average I was traveling 3 meters per second, but I could have started off slow, sped up in the middle, and then slowed down at the end. So I could have been traveling faster than 3 meters per second sometime in the middle, but slower than 3 meters per second at the beginning and the end. So all I know is that on average, my average velocity was 3 meters per second. The velocity problem is interested in the question of, what is your instantaneous velocity at a given moment in time? So what was my instantaneous velocity at the beginning of my travels, or at the middle of my travels, or at the end of my travels? How do I figure that out? That's our velocity problem. So let's look at an example. Suppose I have a car position given by this table of values. So in the first row we've got times, and our second one we've got positions. So at time zero, it's at position zero. At time one, so at one second, it's at 10 feet. At two seconds, it's at 32 feet, and so on. Let's work out the average velocities over some intervals. So over, starting at the time of two, so we're starting right here, time two, What's the average velocity over the next three seconds? So the average velocity is given by the distance traveled divided by the time elapsed. So what's our distance traveled? Well, that would be the ending position, which is s of 5, minus the starting position, which was s of 2. Starting position for when we're doing these measurements, and we're starting at time 2. And what's our duration? That was three seconds. And so this is 178 minus 32 all over 3. Or in other words, 146 over 3. What's 146 over 3? Can I simplify that down? Well, I can write it as a mixed fraction. I can write it as, um, so what is that? That's 48 and 2 thirds. How do I get that? Well, you know, I notice that 146 can be split up into a bunch of things that I can see are divisible by 3 and then something left over. So 3 goes into 124 times, or so sorry, 3 goes into 120 40 times, goes into 24 8 times, so that's 48 and 2 thirds left over. And so that's feet per second. So the average velocity oh, starting at time 2 and for the next 3 seconds, the average velocity was 48 and 2 thirds feet per second. What about starting at time 2 and just considering 2 seconds, the 2 second interval? Well, that's s of 4 minus s of 2 all over 4 minus 2. Change in distance over the change in time. And that is then 119 minus 32 all over 2, or 87 over 2, or what is that? That's 43 and a half feet per second. So starting at time 2 and just looking at the 2 second interval, the average velocity was 43 and a half. What about starting at time 2 and just looking at a 1 second interval? So that's s of 3 minus s of 2 all over 3 minus 2. And so that is 70 minus 32 all over 1 or 38 feet per second. So if I'm looking on just this short interval here, from time 2 to time 3, over that one second interval, the average velocity was 38 feet per second. If I looked at an extended interval, it was 43 and a half feet per second. So we can see that the object, the car, is actually speeding up. It was traveling slower over that first second than it was over the first two seconds. And then over the first three seconds, it was actually traveling much faster. So it seems to be speeding up.
So it's accelerating. Now, what is the meaning of the number that we see on your car speedometer as you're traveling through city traffic? So your car speedometer is not telling you an average velocity. It's telling you your velocity right at the moment you're looking at it. It's telling you your instantaneous velocity. So it's your instantaneous velocity that is telling you. So how do we get an instantaneous velocity? Well, the idea is to look at what we calculated about here. We looked at average velocities over shorter and shorter intervals. If I instead look over a fraction of a second, from time 2 to maybe time 2.1, look over a little small time interval, that's giving me a better idea of how fast I'm traveling right at that moment of two seconds. And if I keep shrinking the interval, the time interval down, closer and closer to two, so I'm looking at two to two gen just a little bit, and figure out how far I've traveled and divide by the time I've traveled, then I'm getting a value for my average velocity, which is pretty close to my instantaneous velocity. So what do we have here? We have that the average velocity over the interval from time 2 to time 2 plus just a little bit is given by, well what's it given by? It's given by our position at that second time minus the position that we started at, all over our time elapsed, which is delta t. The average velocity is this, and as this time interval, delta t, shrinks to zero, as it gets closer and closer to zero, as that second point we take for our sampling is close to our first point, this approaches, so this being the average velocities, approaches the instantaneous velocity. Okay, you may look at this and say, well, that looks pretty familiar. It kind of looks like the tangent line problem we had. And in fact, it pretty much is just the tangent line problem we have. If we look at it this way, from above, we've got our curve Now there's our curve, our s, our t versus s curve, and starting at time 2 and moving on, we've essentially been constructing slopes of secant lines. So velocity average is just equal to the slope of the secant line. And you know, right at that point, if we're interested in the instantaneous velocity, the instantaneous velocity is equal to the slope of the tangent line. So looking at the velocity problem in terms of geometry, in terms of the position versus time graph, average velocities are slopes of secant lines, instantaneous velocities are slopes of tangent lines. So these are really one and the same problem. The tangent line problem and the velocity problem are really one and the same problem. And so let's just jot down, as a final remark, the relationship between these problems. So both the tangent and velocity problems are concerned with the question What does this quantity, f of a plus h minus f of a all over h, now this is the written in terms of the function we're trying to find the tangent line um, at the point corresponding to x equals a. Um, this is very similar to what we had above where the function was given by the position function, it was s. A was our starting time, which was 2 in our example, and h 
Well, that's just the small change that we're looking at the input variable. In this case, we called it delta t. Delta t is, is um, uh, usual notation to note small change in t. Um, down here, we used h to denote a small change in x. We could have used delta x as well. I mean, we'll, we'll see this notation get used over and over again throughout this course. So what does this quantity approach as h approaches 0? That's the big question. Both problems boil down to this question. What does this quantity approach as h goes to 0? What do the slopes of the secant lines approach as h goes to 0? What is the value? That's what we're calling the slope of the tangent line. What is the value? So that's our big question. How do we actually compute this quantity? How do we compute what it's going to as h goes to 0? So that's what we're going to start to get into next section. We're going to look at how to compute expressions like this and what they go to as this variable h goes to 0. This leads to what we'll call limits. So if you've heard the term limit before and you, if you've seen calculus, any bits of calculus before, you definitely would have seen the limit. This is where the limit comes up. We want to figure out what this expression is approaching as h goes to 0. This will lead to the idea of a limit and so if you want to write this, this big question here in terms of a limit, you would write it as, and we'll, don't worry if you don't know this notation, this is actually what we're getting to next section, but just um, to sort of finalize what this big question is really asking, it's asking us what is the limiting value as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. That's our big question. Both the tangent line problem and the velocity problem boil down to this question. What is the value of this limit? What is the limiting value of this expression as h goes to 0? In the context of the, the tangent line problem, that's the value of the slope of the tangent line. In the context of the velocity problem, this is the value of the instantaneous velocity. And so we'll study the limits in the next section. All right, thanks very much for watching, and we will see you again next time.